His Eminence Daniel Cardinal DiNardo is the Metropolitan Archbishop of Galveston, Houston, and pastor of its 1.3 million Catholics. Cardinal DiNardo was born in Steubenville, Ohio, and raised with three siblings in Castle Shannon near Pittsburgh. He attended St. Anne grade school in the Jesuit-run Bishop's Latin School before enrolling in St. Paul Seminary and Duquesne University in Pittsburgh. He received his master's degree in philosophy from the Catholic University of America in Washington, D.C., and degrees of sacred theology from both the Pontifical Gregorian University and the Patristic Institute Augustinianum in Rome. He was ordained to the priesthood. He was ordained to the priesthood for the Diocese of Pittsburgh on July 16, 1977, and served as parish pastor, seminary professor, spiritual director, as well as working in the chancery. From 1984 to 1991, he worked in Rome as a staff member for the Congregation for Bishops and as adjunct professor at the Pontifical North American College. In 1991, he returned to Pittsburgh serving as pastor to several parishes and again working in the chancery. He was appointed coadjutor co bishop of Sioux City, Iowa, and ordained there as a bishop in October of 1977. As his episcopal motto, he adopted Ave Crux Spes Unica, meaning Hail the Cross, our only hope. He succeeded retiring Bishop Lawrence Donald Sones of Sioux City in November of 1998. In January 2004, he was named coadjutor bishop of Galveston, Houston, and succeeded Archbishop Joseph Fiorenza on February the 28th, 2006. On June the 29th, 2006, he received the pallium from Benedict the 16th, and in November of 2007, was ele elevated to the College of Cardinals at St. Peter's Basilica in Rome by Pope Benedict. As a member of the Sacred College, he served as a cardinal elector in the papal conclave of 2013, which saw the election of Pope Francis to the See of Peter. Cardinal DiNardo was elected Vice President of the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops in 2013, where he still serves in that role, and where he also serves on numerous committees. Cardinal DiNardo participated in the 2015 Synod on the Family, and we are very pleased to have him here with us this evening as he discusses topics related to the family and to the Synod under the title, Synod Family Accompaniment. Welcome, Cardinal DiNardo. Thank you very much, very kind of you. Thank you, Father, thank you, uh, thank you all. I want to uh, thank Archbishop Schnurr, who, uh, who was uh, studying, we were not exactly classmates together in Rome. He was older than I was in Rome. But he was two years ahead of me at the seminary in Rome. And I also had the privilege of, um, I was named uh, the bishop in Sioux City, Iowa in 97. At that time, uh, Monsignor Schnur was the general secretary of the Bishops' Conference of the United States. And interestingly enough, ironically enough, my predecessor in Houston, uh, Archbishop Fiorenza, uh, wanted Monsignor Schnur to stay longer. And so he called me. It was just crazy. He said, now, Dan, you're not going to let a good man like Monsignor Schnur go back to Sioux City right away when I need him so badly in the bishop's conference. Oh, you know, what are you going to do? I'm a young bishop. I say, okay. So Monsignor Schnur stays on another year and a half and finishes up his term, and they immediately name him Bishop of Duluth, Minnesota, so I never got him back in Sioux City. <laughs> Archbishop Schnur, wonderful, wonderful man. You're lucky to have him here. I am pleased to be at the Athenaeum of Mary Seminary uh, for the uh, to give my um, talk, which are some reflections on the Synod and on the Synod on the Family in particular from this last year. Was suggested to me by Archbishop. It's uh, so the recently completed 14th Ordinary General Assembly of the Bishop that was held in Rome in October of 2015. Uh, at the very get go, 
I do not have an insight on the document that's being published Friday, okay? You get that right away. Say, well, don't they give you some kind of embargoed copy? No, they never gave it to the bishops yet, or at least not as of last night at 9 p.m. Now, whether something was sent today, I don't know, but I don't believe so. I think we'll get something tomorrow because the document is to be published on Friday, and they want to keep it off the presses on Friday rather than... Uh, the full name of the it was the vocation and mission of the family in the church and in the contemporary world. You have to keep the whole line together if you're going to get some sense of what happened at the synod. So it was the vocation and mission. I was an elected member of the uh, synod last fall from the United States, along with Archbishop Joseph Kurtz, the president of the Conference of Bishops, Archbishop of Louisville, Archbishop Charles Chaput, you know him, the Archbishop of Philadelphia, Archbishop Jose Gomez, the Archbishop of Los Angeles, and then there were two bishops appointed by the Holy Father, Bishop Murray of Youngstown, um, who was one of the, uh, the bishops present, and then Archbishop uh, Blaise Supich, the Archbishop of Chicago. Also, Bishop Kurt Burnett represented the Byzantine Church in the world in the United States, the Ruthenian Church. He's, I think he's someplace in New Jersey, Passaic. I think he's the eparch, the Bishop of Passaic. In addition, Cardinals Donald Wuerl and Cardinals Tim Dolan were also members of the, uh, the Synod Universal Office, so they were there. So it was a good United States representation at the 2015 Synod of Bishops. I think that presence was a strong one and a good one. And we used to meet um, most days for Mass early in the morning at the North American College and then be on our way to the Synod. So the, uh, this ordinary Synod, sisters and brothers, had an interesting background in that it was preceded by an extraordinary mini-synod on the same topic the year before. I don't know if you were aware of that, but we had two synods, one right in a row after the other. That was Bishop, or that was Pope Francis' desire. Um, he wanted a, um, a two-week meeting of a smaller representative group of bishops to help clear the way for the big synod in 2015. The recommendations and the proposals of the special or extraordinary synod were received by the Holy Father and immediately said, let's make that the working document for the 2015 synod. Uh, that was Pope Francis. He can do what he wants, as you know, and those kind of things, and that's what he did. So there was a good deal preparation for this 2015 synod. In addition, and I don't know what they did here in Cincinnati, but after the 2014 synod, they, the Universal Synod Committee sent out, based on the work of the 2014 mini-synod, uh, questionnaires. And they were sent around the world and said, find some way to consult the people of God on this. Now, I don't know what they did here. In, in Houston, we just put the entire questionnaire up on our website. And we said, uh, if you want to fill it out, you go ahead and fill it out. I have to say it was rather long and complicated, which was the lament of most of the people who tried to answer the questionnaire. But we got 500 to do it. And then in addition, I called the Family Life Ministries by language group together for them to do some consultations for me. So... We sent all that material, you know, you sent it to the bishops' conference and they sent it all to Rome. So the one thing we can say, brothers and sisters, about the 2015 Synod, there was enough material sent to them. I mean, that would be the understatement of the year. It was more like a flood was sent to the uh, Synod office, the Synod Council in Rome. I'm glad that so many local churches found ways to consult uh, we say the ordinary people of God for their responses, their discussions. Um, other bishops tried a variety of forms of consultations, but I would say the popular routes of consultation, 
fed into the interest for the Senate. And, of course, people gave their considered judgments. And as I looked at the 500, I saw all their 500 responses. They came into Houston. I read them. There were some really wonderful things, some critical things, obviously. But, of course, you always get the ones that use the questionnaires to attack the bishop. I like them because I can figure out what some people think that way. You know, he never cares about this or he never, I like them. Uh, <laughs> you just hear things, you know, it's good. Pope Francis has been interested in the family and the importance of the family to the church and the world since the days of the conclave. I can tell you that in which he was elected. In fact, he had spoken of it often, and he looked forward, as he likes to do, to an intense discussion about issues that he finds crucial to the mission of the church. And for the Pope, the family is the core of the mission of the church. But of course, in order to be sent on mission, you have to be called. And the Pope has been very interested in how we deal with the call of families. Uh, he saw this vigorous kind of discussion as crucial to what he himself would eventually write uh, in a post-apostolic exhortation, which will be published Friday, the common name to a papal document after a synod. He wants to call the church worldwide to embrace, to proclaim, and assist families. He said that as much during the synod. He said that as much in some of his Wednesday audiences. If you've read through some of Pope Francis's Wednesday audiences, he has given a number of talks on the family. The Pope sees pastoral care for and by families in the church as a priority in what he calls the proclamation of the gospel, evangelization. So you can see why this whole Synod process was important to him, we, even right after the conclave that elected him. Do you know, I'm not allowed to tell you anything of what goes on in the conclave. Or I could, but then I'd have to shoot each one of you afterwards. <laughs> but one of the neat things about the conclave is, you know, when somebody's finally elected, can you imagine what it's like to hear your name called out loud at least 79 times? Because you need so many, you know, two-thirds of the vote or whatever. And you have to come down in the front, you know, and they ask you, do you accept? The conclave ends when you give your new name. And it's interesting, the Pope later told us why. He said he had no name chosen when he was elected. Do you believe that? I guess because he didn't think he was going to be elected. And as he's coming down the steps, one of the Brazilian bishops whispered very loudly to him, don't forget the poor. And he said that was the only thing on his mind. So that when they asked him the name, he just said, I just blurted out Francis. Franciscus. Now in my section, at that point, of course, the conclave ends. So I can tell you what happened in my section when he did that. Three cardinals looked around and said, Francis? <laughs> Francis? Did he say Francis? Why would he choose Francis? So that's when the Pope explained to us huh, why he chose Francis. When the ordinary synod met last October, it could be said that there was one source of universal agreement among the 260-plus fathers, an agreement they shared with so many of the people of God who had participated in answering the questionnaires of the working document. That is, that the document itself was not that good, right? That's one thing we all agreed on. <laughs> that it was, it was somewhat incoherent. I mean, it tried to do everything and maybe wasn't clear enough in spots. So that was one thing uh, that we all agreed. It was a bit confusing, not phrased well. It is important, therefore, to remember that the fathers of the Synod engaged in a critical function of the Synod, perhaps a negative one, to outline some important weaknesses in what we call the instrumentum laboris. That just means the working document, right? They always use fancy Latin, don't they, for these things? But that's This would allow for a better formulation of the positive work of the synod 
to make constructive suggestions on issues to be addressed and some solutions for the pastoral care of family to be proposed. And that's the language, suggestion, proposal. Remember, a synod of bishops is not a parliament, notwithstanding the way the media tries to look at it. I'll, I'll get to it in a, little, a few minutes about a synod, but synod makes suggestions to the Holy Father. He can receive the suggestions, he can use them, he can toss them away, he can do whatever he wants with them, right? But a synod is internal uh, to the work of the teaching office of the Holy Father. Now, I would say that the critical, negative, positive, suggestive interval of analysis that we did at the Synod was aided by another methodological move by Pope Francis at this Synod. What was that methodological move? From the get-go, he gave more time, attention, and weight to the small language groups, which had always been part of Synod's, but which were generally at the, towards the end. And uh, Pope Francis wanted him to start meeting almost immediately as the synod began. So they broke us up into language groups and the major language groups. Now you can imagine what they are. Oh, you know, it's English, Spanish, Italian, German, French. I think there was one Portuguese group. Uh, the largest groups wouldn't be surprising to you. Uh, they would be the English and the Spanish. And each group was supposed to be of equal numbers, okay? So that you had, you know, 22 or 25 in each English language group. The same would be true with Spanish and whatnot. These small language groups provided a strong impetus for both the critical assessment of the instrumentum laboris that I just mentioned to you and for the positive recommendations that were received by the whole body of the Synod and put into the final document. Should not underestimate what the language groups did. They were quite important. Uh, I just mentioned uh, what the language groups were. Uh, in my English language group, let me give you an example. We were 27 of us from like 15 different countries. I can't tell you how helpful that was when you're discussing topics in the Synod. And in the same language, as you say, we, are, uh, we share a same language in some fashion. You know, but the, the, the mentality and outlooks would really be different, and they were surprisingly refreshing and helpful uh, to one another. Um, the English and Spanish would be the largest group. You know, I hate to say this, uh, I'm, we're not boasting, but English is the international language now. I would say 80% of all the Synod Fathers spoke English, even though they may have refused to speak English, <laughs> but they knew it and could speak it if they had to. It's because of finance, right? It's the international language because of money, and therefore lots of people speak English. May I also add, a very powerful language was Italian. Why is that? Many bishops from the developing world, where did they study? Rome. So Italian is a very well-known language in the uh, Synod. Uh, our group also included some official observers from the laity that were appointed to the synod. Along with one major superior of religious order, we also had about three or four Eastern Rite bishops, one Ukrainian, one Maronite, one, one Syro-Malabar, one Syro-Malankara bishop. And there were exhilarating discussions to hear the rich cultural traditions of the local churches of the Catholic Church. Sisters and brothers, in the United States, so many people think we're the only Catholic Church that really exists. But remember this, 6% of the world's Catholic population live in the United States. 6%. That means 94% of the Catholic population does not live in the United States. That's a lot of people. They don't share the presuppositions that we have. They have a different outlook, even in terms of the family. I think that has to be, uh, be kept in mind. Uh, if the instrumentum laboris was criticized, or the working document was criticized for it, we, its weaknesses, it still remained the basis for discussion and amendment. 
One of the first amendments to this uh, working document was an introduction, which my group put in, but so did four other groups, saying, we don't like the way the document opens. Why? Because there's nothing that says anything about praising families and married love and couples who even in their difficulties live their lives faithfully to the gospel and in communion with the church and become models of discipleship. If you look at the final document we presented to the Holy Father, that's the introduction. Now, I think it's very important. Part of the issue was the working document, the Instrumentum Laboris, was based on the uh, Aparecida of see, judge, act. And when they saw, they decided just to see just the problems at the beginning. But that's not fair, because you've got to also see the positive things that go on at the beginning as well. So they added this introduction, which we, a number of uh, special language group, groups helped to put together, and I thought that was, it made the document better. For it indeed articulated um, that there are model disciples of married couples and families uh, in the church nowadays. And though their numbers may not be massive, their numbers are not small. And that needs to be stated. The first part of the Synod document was to weigh the various challenges that face family and marriage. Since this part uh, had to be reformulated a lot by the small groups and by the uh, leaders of the small groups as they met in session together, when the first part was finally looked at, it received, by the way, almost unanimous approval. With the use of that introduction, plus some changes in almost every number of the first, I don't know, 30 numbers. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, part one on the C, that is what's going on, what are the challenges, did receive pretty significant unanimous uh, consent. Divided into uh, four parts, each part treated, or sections, I should say, each section treated cultural and social contexts and the tensions that arise for families today. The changes in the understanding of the human condition, which they call anthropological changes, uh, and what that has this effect on family and on the meaning of marriage. The religious situation in many parts of the world today that does not give strength to marriages, and the weakening of a number of institutions that surround marriage. In addition, perhaps under the influence of uh, the bishops from South America and from the Pope himself, questions of economic and social conditions that affect the structure of the family were not missing in this section. And that's true. Uh, not surprisingly, the challenges outlined concern some intense secularization in some parts of the world, less so in other parts of the world. Everyone is concerned, including developing countries, of the lessening of, tie, of ties to a traditional understanding of human relationships. And among the young, not just in the developed world, but also in the developing world where the young move from the countryside to cities, the avoidance of permanent commitments, which was seen... <coughs> as particularly significant. Uh, we all know how significant it is here in our country uh, by many young people. The grasping for more goods, which makes human beings into commodities and the commodification of the human person. The growth in the developed nations of a rugged individualism that prizes personal freedom and autonomy over everything else. And it results in a desire for even more things, thus the materialism. There is a lack of appreciation, therefore, for human life. So it's one of the main points that, that section one deals with. Now, are there ways in which this is made vivid and maybe horribly vivid in the world? Sure. Uh, abortion. Uh, illicit uses of reproductive technology. Fragile economic situations, uh, particularly in the treatment of women. As you can see, the document does try to outline a whole number of uh, 
matters that are, are a matter of seeing uh, and that are really hard, particularly, and not surprising, the bishops from the developing nations pressed on the intense poverty that afflicts many and causes grand disruptions in family life and family togetherness. They also spoke about the globalization of economic forces, which has devastating effects on many young adults in developing parts of the world, and the corruption of political and economic institutions that has their effect, have their effects in making family life precarious. There were two significant paragraphs on immigration, emigration, and refugees. That should not be surprising. The resultant trauma to both families and individuals, individual persons in these kinds of issues was highlighted. There was emphasis placed on solidarity and accompaniment by Christian communities in the midst of these problems with refugees and immigration and emigration. It was also in this section that the Synod dealt with a very important phenomenon, the persecution of Christian communities and other minorities in the Middle East and other parts of the world. It heard a very insistent cry from the patriarchs and bishops of the Eastern Christian communities in the Holy Land, the Middle East, and parts of Asia, to the point that they got up in one general session and really went after us you know, in terms of this horror that's uh, going on. I mention an, a, a, another aside at this point. There were two members of our English language group, a couple from Iraq. They were a mute presence. They spoke no English, but they didn't speak much of any other language except Arabic. And we had a Maronite right bishop from Lebanon in our group who spoke English and Arabic, and he would speak for them or translate for them. Um, you can imagine what their presence was like, though. You imagine that your whole family's gone or moved from its 1,000-year-old peasant village as a Christian village in Iraq. It's gone, and you're living in Jordan or whatever. You imagine the effect this has on family structure. So if you want to talk about family difficulties, we certainly have family difficulties in the United States and in the developed world. Some of the family difficulties we have are the result of our own selfishness. But what can you say to the mute presence of a couple who wants to see their family together but can't be there because they're refugees? It's very sobering, friends. It lets you see the bigger picture. Uh, another aspect of this opening part I will mention was the related but distinguished treatment in five separate paragraphs of men, women, children, and young adults, and uh, older people. The reason we did it is because there was some criticism that there wasn't enough attention paid, for instance, to violence against women or to what happens to a certain machismo in men, for instance, in South America. So the city reworked them. We did. We reworked it so that each of these would at least be mentioned in the what we'd call the C of the C, judge, and act part of the document. Uh, I thought that uh, this section was, uh, was, uh, was pretty good. I am not doing justice to the range of realities covered by this part one, but I just wanted to give you a little bit of a global vision and some anecdotes of what the challenges to marriage and family life are that were noted in the Synod. Some of these you'd say, yes, you could shake your head. There may be others you hadn't thought of. And if you read the whole document, you can see there were a whole number of issues of challenges to the family that were mentioned by the bishops. The high range, as I mentioned, of almost unanimous yeses to this section is a testimony to a great deal of work done by the individual language groups that improved uh, the original working document in part one. Now, what was part two of the document? Part two would be the judge. That was a review and analysis of the family in the plan of God. In other words, the teaching of our faith in scriptures, revelation, and the tradition of the church and the church's magisterium. So it was kind of a summary of the vocation and call of the person to family life as shown in the scriptures and the mission of the family in the scriptures, tradition, and teaching office of the church. Interestingly enough, friends, 
even this part, likewise had a good number of revisions. The fathers of the synod were not totally happy about everything in this. Let me give you just a couple of examples. For instance, the scriptural citations that were given were the classic ones in many ways, in Genesis and all, um, for the Old Testament. But a number of our bishops now, you know, are scripture people who studied scripture. So they raised rankles by saying, why isn't there any quotations from the wisdom literature? Where's the Song of Songs, the book? Where are some of the prophetic literature on this in the Old Testament? So whether or not all the passages were put in, they were all then cited. So that was a change right there. In the New Testament, the obvious classic references to marriage in Matthew and Mark were there, Paul's letters. But the uh, scripture people said, you should mention more Johannine literature on the love of God and what that means. That's important to understanding the full stature of family and family life. So some of those little things were added. You would know that if you looked at the document, but that happened. Then we went into Revelation and the church's teaching office. And here I have to say, uh, this is another part where the language groups played their part. The magisterial teaching went rightfully, when the, when the working document came out, they were going to emphasize uh, what Pope Francis had said. But the, uh, the bishop said, wait a minute. Who spoke about family a whole lot? St. John Paul II. Where's his writing in this? What about the familiaris consortio? What about some of the things he wrote and said? So all that stuff got put in and added. It's in the uh, uh, working document. Now, I thought that was a great move by uh, uh, the bishops. They also, and here, I mean, I play a minor role in this, but I looked at the section they did on, uh, on family life and openness to life and family planning, and I said, this doesn't do justice to Mani Vitae. As they say on that day in the synod, there was some silence in the room. But afterwards, in the language groups, they did say, yeah, there should be more said on this. So that also entered into the document a little more completely. So I think John Paul II is what they call the theology of the body, or some of his Wednesday audiences, you know, on the self as gift, uh, the sexual self as self-gift, the importance of that. Um, by the way, this entire part now closes with a reference to mercy and what St. Thomas Aquinas had to say about mercy. So it's, it's actually, it's not a bad section at all. It's, it's a little bit telescoped. But even the bishops were getting worried how long the document was going to be if we put in everything we wanted. So that's what happened. So part two was also almost uh, unanimously approved by the, um, the bishops. And it's in part two where we see the call of the family to married family life and the mission. And we're sent out. I think Pope Francis had a great deal to do with that mission aspect that's in Part two. Now, this leads me to say some comments. Uh, the 14th General Synod of Bishops last October was the 50th anniversary of the institution of a Synod of Bishops, right? Synod of Bishops was instituted by Pope Paul VI at the end of the Second Vatican Council to give a way for bishops to continue to be a consultative force for the See of Peter. And so last... Uh, fall was the 50th anniversary. During last fall, on one Saturday, a group of, uh, I don't know if they were experts, I thought they were pretty good, gave some talks on the meaning of a synod. Pope Francis was there and gave a conclusion to it. But I, I bring this up because it says something about what a synod is. Uh, the, one of the best talks was by Cardinal Schoenberg. Do you know who he is? The Archbishop of Vienna. He was a student of Pope Benedict. He's the one that's the basic author behind the catechism of the Catholic Church, okay? No, he's not a slouch, right? And uh, Cardinal Schoenberg gave up and gave a most interesting presentation on what a synod does. And he emphasized anew, wait a minute, he said, this is not a parliament. This is an, or, this is an exercise now of the magisterium of the Pope looking for some counsel. And that's what the synod is supposed to be. It's a sharing. And he tried to say, is there anything in Scripture that I can make an analogy? Not a direct con you know, comparison, but an analogy. And um, Cardinal Schoenberg went to Acts of the Apostles, chapter 15. That's the famous Council of Jerusalem. 
Do you know what was going on there? As you know, they're admitting um, Christians without making them Jewish. That's Paul and Barnabas, or if you prefer seminarians, Barnabas and Paul. <laughs> you know, who's on first on this one? And there, uh, and it's caused some issue in the early church. Schoenberg points out what happens. He said, when they gather everyone together in Jerusalem, because there's no little trouble going on, Peter stands up and gives the opening and says, I'm not going to try to push things, but this is, here's where I see things. Then others get up and witness to what has taken place. Then the apostolic teaching of James and others and Peter comes through. And then through the power of the Holy Spirit, there's a decision. In some ways, it's more like an ecumenical council than it is a synod. But what Cardinal Schoenberg was calling attention to and I thought was very good is he said, we may not do enough in synods on witnessing to what we have heard and seen in the life of faith in the church and how the Holy Spirit is working. He said maybe that's what the bishop should do in a synod. And that when that happens, what's the result? And Schoenberg used a word that is so common in the Acts of the Apostles and even in the letter to the Hebrews and in other <coughs> Pauline letters, which is paresia, boldness. It's the way Luke opens up his gospel. Have you ever read the opening of the Gospel of Luke as they say? the best periodic Greek sentence ever in the New Testament. What does that mean? It's really long, and it's only one sentence. We can't do that in English. But at the very end of that periodic sentence, Luke tells Theophilus why he's doing all this stuff, doing this, this account of what happened to, with Jesus and the words and deeds among us and all this. Why is this? So that you may have paresia, boldness and confidence about what you've heard and seen. That's an important word in the New Testament. And Schoenberg was trying to tell us, maybe as bishops, although we all come with our point of view, which is true, and we want to speak the teaching of the apostles, which is very important, what we have seen and heard and our testimony is extremely important for the church. We may not realize how crucial that is, that when Luke Acts does this, uh, that he may have a point of what he wants to be seen. Now, I thought it was an interesting analysis that Cardinal Schoenberg made. And I thought it said something about what I feel or what I think synods are about. Okay. So much for me getting on my soapbox about something. Now we go to part three. That's the one the media likes, right? You know, part one, you do analysis, you know, they'll yawn, they'll say, oh, they looked at this, and uh, part two, the teaching authority of the church, you know, what they teach teaches, yeah, yeah, yeah. Part three, now that's the juicy stuff. What are you going to do about it? Come on, you're going to give them communion or aren't you? you know, isn't, that's the way some people reduced the October 2015 Synod. Part three, the word accompaniment was given to us by Pope Francis. He, he, he had used the word before, but he particularly used it in the Synod. And he wanted that word to be a genuine reality, not just a concept. That what he wanted to see was how do we accompany people in the variety of the situations of their lives in their call to family? They're living out the mission of the family and the gospel and the troubles that they face. And so the, uh, the third part is an accompaniment. Um, how do we accompany people in the sacrament of marriage? Now, I want to give you, uh, first off, was there a number of, uh, this goes from number 57 to 84 in the document we sent to the Pope. Were there a couple of numbers that were almost unanimous in this session? Yes. You should be alert to that. What was one that was incredibly unanimous on the part of the bishops? We need to do better in marriage preparation. And they divided marriage preparation, interestingly enough, into remote, proximate, and immediate. And said, we may have good programs for immediate, but the damage may have been done proximately and in remote, mainly because maybe nothing's been done. And that's what we need to do. Let me give you an analogy that one of the bishops stood up in one of the big meetings and said, I spend 10 years 
forming any one of my seminarians for priesthood. I'll give them six months for marriage, you know, in terms of how we prepare people. What's wrong with this? What's wrong with this situation? That is, we may not be introducing children, young people, early enough into the meaning of family and the call of the sacrament of marriage. And we're uh, reaping the whirlwind because of that. Because if nothing much has been done or been done too vaguely, by the time you get them for pre cana or marriage preparation, it may be really decent stuff, right? But how much of it's going to take or even be internalized because it can't be internalized? There's already been an issue that has not been handled all the way along. The Pope, by the way, in speaking about all these things, has said, we also have to be careful in accompaniment that we do not reduce it, and I think he was looking at Anglo-Saxons, to another program. Isn't that what we do? We've got a problem here. Let's make another program. Let's put another program together. We have a huge number of um, people from other You know, we have over half church. It's probably about 1.6 million. We list 1.3 million. We have so many undocumented immigrants, it isn't funny, right? They won't register for anything, let alone register to be Catholic. But they'll come to us. And in some of these uh, 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 people, when they want something in terms of what can you do, a, a program, oh, you want me to get another mic? on it. <laughs> I thought so too. <laughs> It's probably the same. <laughs> it's probably the same. Well, we're back. Um, what was I talking about? Oh, I was talking about marriage preparation and about Houston. When we do uh, things, you know, we ask questionnaires in Houston, you can always tell when the Anglos are saying, let's do another program. When you talk to the Hispanics or the Filipinos, let's do a retreat. Let's spend all day in prayer, and then let's eat and have a big thing. That's it. <laughs> But that's how formation is done in those cultures, right? They're not being funny. That's how formation is done. Formation doesn't happen by the classroom. Uh, the formation won't, it, it may happen in the course of a spiritual talk or retreat and in the, in the mutual sharing. You know, I have 165,000 Filipinos in Houston, and 85% of them are Catholic. They're very d devout, and, and devotion means more for formation than, um, than lectures. The same would be true in the uh, Vietnamese communities. By the way, uh, we have four Vietnamese parishes, totally Vietnamese parishes, plus they are, we have about 35,000 Vietnamese, Catholic Vietnamese. Do you know what they do in their parishes on Sunday mornings before, man? I just love it. Everybody stands up and sings the Ten Commandments in Vietnamese. It's a built-in formation vehicle. All the kids know the Ten Commandments because they sing them every Sunday. It's interesting how cultures have produced religious formation because of necessity, right? Persecution, who knows what else. Uh, so when we're dealing with accompaniment for remote, proximate, and immediate preparation, try to think in terms of, well, as Pope says, we need more stable couples to accompany couples who are preparing for marriage. That's important. I don't know. I haven't taken a course. You don't need to take a course. Uh, just live the witness and how God has worked in your life as a couple. You'll be doing a lot for a, an engaged couple. I don't have the time. Of course you do. You can make the time for one couple. 
In other words, Pope Francis is saying we need this one-on-one. -on -one. You have an encounter with the Lord in his mission with your spouse. You have to make that known to somebody else. So one of the things the fathers all agreed on we need to do better in preparation of couples for marriage. The second point that they all unanimously agreed on, we have to now, if we aren't doing it, do much more work for newly married couples. It was another one of those numbers that received unanimous approval from the bishops. One of the most dangerous but beautiful times for married couples is what, the first eight years. We have to catch them at that time and show the face of marriage through married couples, who knows, maybe some programs in church. There's a lot of possibilities. Um, that's important. That helps to bring a couple to realize that they need Jesus in their lives because they're seeing others helping them. And that means you have to go out of yourself to do that. But I thought those two groups of agreement by all the fathers of the synod, whether you were from uh, Kerala in southern India or from uh, Nigeria or Nairobi, Kenya, you know, it's interesting, isn't it? It's a very important dimension that all of the synod fathers uh, agreed on. Uh, that's, by the way, number 57 in the document that we gave. Uh, number 58, celebrating wedding days, the importance of what the document calls, in the typical language we use, mystagogical catechesis on the day of a wedding, because so many people come to weddings that don't ever go to church otherwise. We need to take advantage of that. They said priests do, in terms of their preaching at weddings. May I add something else that has happened in my own archdiocese? We have <coughs> numbers of couples who are as Hispanic, a lot of Latinos, who are not married in the church. They're either living together or maybe they have some kind of a civil arrangement. Now, sometimes they've been together years and you try to figure out why, why won't you get married in church? We're waiting to save money so we can have a big celebration. We notice this a lot, particularly in some of the Mexican couples. So we have figured out in some parishes, and here's where you have to use some innovation. If you can get one couple to validate their marriage at a Sunday liturgy, say, we're going to do it and do the preparation, you can have five other couples join them. So you do big, oh, that's okay, I already have water here. You're very kind, but I have it. I'm just... I haven't breathed yet to take it, but I will. Uh, the, we've seen parishes that have done six validations at a Sunday Mass and then turn it into a huge party. And people like that. The community thinks that's great. Now, there's a way in which you get them married in church. You know, particularly for some of them who've been co cohabitating for 15 or 18 years, they've got all these kids, you say, why did you get married in church? Well, we're saving up please. You know, we want a big celebration. You can have a big celebration. We'll do it for you. We'll do it in the parish. Uh, those are the kinds of things it seems to me, people of God, we've got to be innovative on. That's what it means to accompany people, and you don't immediately turn people off. You know, it's the old days, you know, if somebody came in, they were cohabiting and said, this is awful. You separate, and then we'll come back and talk to me. Well, sisters and brothers, even to get them to come in nowadays is a miracle. So, you know, if you say that, that's, that ends the miracle right there. You do need to tell them we need to do work together, you know. It's like a couple comes. They're cohabiting or in a civil marriage, and they want their baby baptized. The worst thing to do is to say, well, we'll see about it. We don't, I don't know, we can baptize your baby. You're not, li you know, you're not in a sacramental marriage. Wait a minute. Baptize your baby. I can assure you, you can get them into a sacramental marriage in 70% of the times. If you stick with them. It takes time to accompany. That's what Pope Francis means by accompaniment. His sense of accompaniment is not to say what they're doing is right. His sense of accompaniment is to say, be with them as Jesus would, and lead them along so they see the truth. You don't say, what's the matter with you? You don't know the truth. Well, friends, I hate to tell you, but a lot of people that don't know the truth today, I am shocked and amazed at the ignorance of people on the meaning of their faith. But you can either say, oh, this is the most horrible thing, or you can say, okay, this is what we got to deal with, right? You know, being shocked too much is, is, a, is a downer after a while. 
Why be shocked? You know, work with them. We, we find out in Houston that's what we uh, have to do. So those points on that document, I think, are superb. And I think the bishops of the Synod were well to witness to what we can do to accompany people in these troubled situations. The document also mentions uh, w walking with people who are single parents. That wasn't in the original instrumental words. We added it. And that was some of the lady who asked us to do that. That this is an issue. You've got people who are in single parents. A lot of times it's women. Sometimes they may not have been married, but there they are raising kids. You've got to be, you've got to be of help to them. You have to walk with them. That's all that I think the Pope meant. You have to walk with them. It doesn't mean you can always agree of how it came about, but it's the all on all four situation that we have. Um, may I also add number sixty three. The reworked original document of the, um, on human generativity and openness to human life. I think it reads much better than the original did. And it's because we, we told them they had to do far more work on Paul VI and John Paul II on openness to human life. The ones that got really antsy, friends, and it's what you've been waiting for me to hear talk about tonight, is right towards the end, all right? 83, 84, that number. Now, Sisters and brothers, in the consistory, the Cardinal consistory of February 2014, Cardinal Walter Casper got up and he did a paper for the Cardinals relative to what's happened in marriage and he gives a history tradition. Some of it was good, some of it I thought was a little spacey. But at the very end, he makes this proposal, which had been made before in Germany, that for those couples that had been in second marriages without annulment, you know, and they're in civil marriages, but happened a long time. There, might there be a case to be made uh, for some of them to go through a period of repentance and penance and then be admitted to confession and communion? Uh, I have to say, I was there in the February 2014 consistory. The reception of Cardinal Casper's talk was, to say the least, underwhelming. The cardinals didn't like it. Well, the Pope thought though there were points that could be used. So they, they kept talking about it, and they used it for the 2014 Synod. Now, it also came up at the 2015 Synod through whom? Through the German bishops, right? They're the ones who want it. If you look at the number that concerns something similar to it, it is very watered down. And even it, though it got a majority, it did not get very unanimous support by the bishops. In point of fact, friends, many bishops are very, very hesitant about admitting those people, as it is, particularly given Mitis Judex Dominus Jesus, you know, the new document of the Pope on uh, streamlining annulments that was so much possibility around that we're not too happy. I have to tell you myself, I'm not very happy about it. Mainly because we say marriage is indissoluble. Well, if it's indissoluble, isn't it also exclusive? How can you say marriage is indissoluble but not exclusive? The first marriage is never is indissoluble, okay. But what if you admit someone to communion after 30 years in a second marriage without anything else being done except, re what does repentance mean there? So I have troubles with it. I don't know what the Pope's gonna do with it. Our, our uh, number on that, you can read it, is relatively vague. That is, it leaves some doors open, but not totally open. I don't know what the Pope will do with this. I'm not sure at all. I can just tell you that from the point of view of most of the bishops in the United States who were there and some other bishops I talked to, they're just very leery of it because it seems unclear to them. And if it's doctrinally fuzzy, they're worried that uh, 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 pastoral practice that is doctrinally fuzzy will end up making matters worse, not better. That's all. I'd like to leave it like that for that number. If you want to pick my brain, you can go ahead and do it. I probably won't answer much more than that on it because I don't know what the Pope's going to say, but that's where we left it in the Synod. We put much more emphasis on accompanying people in troubled situations where even though there can't be necessarily an improvement, that doesn't mean you can't walk with people and help them see that in their sufferings, whatever's happened, that we're with them. To my mind, that's part of what Pope Francis wants. If the church is a field hospital, we always know there's going to be trauma around, right? You help people with the trauma. That doesn't mean you can totally end the trauma or you can end all suffering and pain. We can't do that, but we can't walk with people. And to my mind, the beauty of the Synod document uh, that we gave to the Pope was its ending, where it ended not on problems, but it ended on a, a jubilant expression of what the mission of the family is today, somewhat like its beginning.
that in fact the family is called to a beautiful, beautiful mission in the world, to witness to God's enduring love in the love of spouses and the love they show to their families, their children, and particularly they kept emphasizing in the extended family, which of course makes perfect sense in Africa and Asia, but maybe not so much sense in the United States. The extended family. And that's a very important aspect of our way of witnessing in the world to Jesus Christ our Lord. Uh, I said I would talk to just about an hour, which it is right now, uh, and so I'm going to end on that beautiful note. And I will open myself up to uh, uh, some questions. You've been a very attentive audience. Thank you very much. Thanks. <laughs> All right. You're going to take the questions? I think we'll use this mic here. Okay. Uh -huh. And after one of the couple um, got married again uh, for 25 years, it seems to me that the 25 years gives a witness. It might not follow all the dictates of the law, but there is a witnessing within that that it seems to me speaks. Sure, and um, although I do not think time itself is creative, people may be creative within the time frame. And uh, no one wants to deny there isn't a, a good witness. My question always to that is, why don't they seek an annulment of the first marriage? If it's only seven years, there's good ground. Something may have really been wrong there at the beginning. I'm sorry? Ah, so oh, those, those times are, are tricky things. May I play the, not that that isn't a good issue, because all these are anecdotes, and anecdotes always help us. Let me, uh, let me tell you an anecdote from the total other side. All righty. 18 months ago, I met someone in Houston. They wanted to talk to me. It was a young man who was probably about 30, 39 years old. His parents separated when he was 13 and his sister was 14 and a half. Up till that time, he said, my life was pretty normal, kid, you know, baseball, that kind of stuff. And though they had problems, he said, you know, it was not. He said, from, from that, the day they announced that to me, uh, my life fell apart. Fell apart. Um, and he said, it was horrible. And he said, they always said two things to me, my parents. It's not your fault. We love you. You have to learn to grow up. And he said, my dad was the first to take off. And within two years, he was married again after they were separated and divorced. And he has a new family. And he said, of course, I was you know, 15 or 16. I didn't get along there at all. I said, but meanwhile, back with my mother, uh, I was holding my mother's hand all the time. Well, she was crying, weeping, all this for the first couple years. Then she met somebody. And she went off, and they eventually got married. She joined another church. But now, 20 years later, he's 38 or 39 now, this guy. And um, he wants to to uh, return to the practice of the faith and thinks that uh, he should be admitted to confession and communion with his new wife and his blended family. And this guy said this to me. Um, they kept telling me to grow up. I tried to be the grown-up. I wasn't supposed to be the grown-up then. They were supposed to be the grown-up. Now I'm grown-up. I want to be a child. 
He was mad. He was infuriated. He was angry. Is he totally right? No. Is he supposed to be an adult now? Yes. Can he be an adult very well now? Uh -uh. Don't ever forget the children in a divorce and what happens to them. I always told my parents, he said to me, oh, it's okay. I said it wasn't okay. It was never okay from the get-go. But they kept saying, it's not your fault. We love you. Grow up. So I did, or at least I tried. We always have to keep that kind of aspect in mind. When the church is making comments about receiving someone in a new marriage, as it were, into the church, however creative and loving that new marriage may be, in a, in a civil way of speaking or human way of speaking. So I'm, I'm very, very nervous about it. That's all I can tell you. I'm just nervous about granting uh, this kind of thing without the procedure of uh, a major annulment in these issues. However, what happens, as one bishop told me, where marriage didn't last long and the wife was pretty much abandoned. She didn't want to get mar married again and all, but in the course of time, there was issues for her own welfare. She marries again. Should we blame her so much of what the husband did 25 years earlier? Those are all interesting questions, aren't they? they are, they're, not, they're not simple. They're not something we can answer easily. Um, but I, for one, am, am more cautious. As maybe I could phrase it that way, sir. I'm just more cautious, even about what seems to be good situations of a new marriage that's uh, 25 years and seems to have, have done well. Um, where there's a uh, you know, refusal of annulment, that's problematic. The only solution we do have in our church is brother-sister relationship, right, in those kinds of scenes. None of it's easy. It really isn't. Not easy at all. Good question. A very nice question. Yes. You mean for simplifying annulments? No, no, no. On the, on this paper, on the, on the actions. Yeah, we, there's a list. Uh, no, we, we just in general made comments. You know, you, you can read our document that went to the Pope. <coughs> he might. He might. He might tell him. We'll find out Friday. I mean, I, I can't imagine he's not going to take up some that the Senate in that um, in our document last October. I mean, most popes do that. When they write the post synodal apostolic, they'll say, in number here, the, the bishops mentioned this and this, and here's what I say and what I think or what I hope will happen. I think he'll, he'll do that. I surely hope he does it on the uh, marriage prep and accompanying newlywed couples. I really hope he does something on that. Can't imagine he won't, but on other things, I don't know. We'll see. But I'd, I'd, I'd like to think, and I think Pope Francis did. He came to the sessions, not the special language sessions, but he'd go to the big sessions when they would summarize them. So he heard everything. So it's not as though he didn't hear it. And he was, uh, it's like Pope Benedict, when Pope Benedict used to go to the Senate. He would just sit there and listen. He never spoke. He used that time to listen, which I think was great. Yes. We got about, well, we probably have 1.7 million Catholics, and we have 300,000 or 400,000 that are undocumented. Undocumented? Yeah, for us. How do we, we, we have a hard time, I mean, be, being from this part of the country, we get the news, we just have a hard time relating to it, but as a church, we understand how that can create dysfunctional things. Absolutely. How do we respond to that? How does the city respond to that? Uh. Yeah. I mean, more so than some of these other countries because they're coming here. I mean, that's our perspective. Yeah. But like you said, there's six percent Catholics. I think you said in this country. Of all the Catholic population throughout the world, yeah. So we see things. We well, sure, and and of course the immigration issue is a tough one. These people are coming from basically South America, Mexico, right? Uh, and uh, they come up here, and they're not documented, and they're. Um, 
Sometimes they come as uh, one, and then others come with them. Sometimes they come as families. We, we've got a horrible, horrible problem in Texas of un- undocumented migrant, uh, minors who come through. What happens to those poor kids is horrific. You can just imagine the kinds of abuse they go through. So we have a huge issue in Texas with the um, immigrants and emigrants and refugees. Houston has the uh, dubious distinction of having one of the largest human trafficking rings in the United States. So it's horrible. Uh, that, that destroys, that messes up families, you know. We would like to see, that's why the bishops keep saying, we sense that there should be reunification of families. And of course, some people get infuriated, you know, that's just making the problem worse. No, reunification of families, and you register them so people know who they are, is, is to my, our mind, would be good. I certainly think it would be good in Texas. We have an ecumenical coalition on it. But as you can imagine, in Texas, the immigration issue makes tempers flare, you know. It's no question. But they're in our parishes. They may not register, but they come to Mass. You know, they get their kids baptized. Maybe they'll do that much. We have a parish in Houston. It lists on its books 2,300 families, okay? It's a big, for us, that's a small place, but our sizes are four, five, 6,000 families in our parishes. And um, it's 2,300 families. Two years ago, you know how many baptisms they had? 1,200 baptisms. All undocumented, probably. Hispanics. Get their kids baptized. Stay a few months, maybe move to another place. No, they're, oh, they're gone. So we have, uh, we have real issues. We try to do pre preparation so they'll do it the week before and then the week of the baptism, at least to get two sessions worth of formation and prayer together for the couples, some of whom aren't married, right, before they baptize their babies. Uh, it's a... Uh, we have some real issues, but we have a great, we have a great RCIA program, though. I was saying, you know, this year we brought uh, almost 2,300 people into the church. 1,900 of them were catechumens. Houston's got a lot of pagans. It's beautiful. <laughs> it's great to have pagans. They're very receptive to the word. Huh? Uh, this constant use of the Christian initiation of adults and with Children, because we get, if you get two kids who are 10 years old, you know, or 10 or 11, and they get their dad who's never been baptized in, you can do the RCIA, you can do lots of things in families to help that family come along. I think families should pray together. That's one way you can get them to pray together. So there are all kinds of ways to accompany people. Uh, I have a big growing church. I'm delighted to see so many people at Mass every Sunday. You know, so that I've had to build, we've had to build 26 new church buildings I've had to dedicate in the last eight years. And we're in huge growth in Houston. And we can't, all the masses are packed, standing in, in the aisles. It's a beautiful problem, but that's still only covering, what, 30% of the people in Houston who are Catholic or nominally Catholic. So, so we, we got our issues. So I, I'm big for accompaniment. Do what you can. Be innovative. But we have to love the immigrants. And if you do that, you're going to get some people who hate you. You just have to accept it. They're going to send you nasty letters. It's just for those immigrants. It's a difficult time in the United States right now. Yeah, you have a question. Thank you. Two questions quickly. How do we accompany our single friends? People who really don't feel part of the family. Yeah. Second question, and then I'll sit down, is what can we do about the media? Was that discussed at all? The How media? They like to commodify things in the media. I don't know what we do about that. They just commodify persons, commodify everything. It's horrible. Uh, it's what we live with. Uh, you know, you have to, in some ways, uh, you have to, in the best sense, not the worst sense, in the best sense, shelter your kids or talk to them about some of this stuff. Show that's not, it's not the way we live. As far as your other question, in, in, uh, in Houston, we have two massive groups called the single adults. You know, one of young adult professionals, the other for the Hispanic. Uh, the last meeting I had with the Hispanics, they did an overnight adoration, meetings, food, carrying on. Over a thousand single young adults showed up for it. I, you have to give them solidarity with one another, with single young adults. That's the, that's the only thing I know what to do. 
uh, they do feel alienated sometimes from the church, but they feel alienated sometimes from their families. In Houston, we get the Hispanics, you know, they're coming up singly alone, maybe from another country. They get jobs, they're working, they're all alone, you know, they get into trouble. That's why we try to do something with solidarity with them in terms of the church, so that they can stay, stay somewhat close to. It's not an easy group to deal with. Plus, those groups, I find single adults, we do cuff totally cut, you know what that is? Where they, you, you know, use a bar-like concept. You know, they come in and they have their beers and drink, and then a priest or someone shows up, and, you, and you, they have a theme, but then they can ask questions. It's really informal. We do that in the summer, Cafe Catolica, for four weeks in a row. I always go to do one of them. A thousand kids show up for it. Now they're young adults. There are ways in which you can get them. I don't, I mean, I, I, I have great honor for those priests and lay ministers who know how to work this out. Because when I come, it's easy. They're already there. I don't have to worry. They're already there. But uh, I think we have to pay attention. They are alienated. I would agree with you. It's a serious issue. Because if they remain alienated, then when they get married, it probably won't be in church. Or if it's in church, then they're not interested, you know? So it's a, it's a big issue. It's a very big issue. Okay, are we done? Oh, it's good. Listen, friends, thank you very much. You've been a very wonderful, wonderful group of people. Thank you. God bless. Close it. Close it.